think they're going to be really great sources. By the way, I'm Susanna Spear, and I'm a Press Club member. So I'm introducing um, everyone, and here is Peter Bonda, and he's going to be talking to Ponzi and Winsella Wetz. Thank you. Thank you. She had, she, she had great coaching. She had great coaching. Uh, hi, welcome everyone. Uh, as Susanna mentioned, um, we have two criminologists from Regis University. We have Vinny, I like saying that, Vinny, Vincent Winselowitz, and Jim Ponzi. Uh, both have had long, illustrious careers. Um, um, I have lots of questions I want to ask them, and, and which will, will kind of uh, clue those who, would be, who are reporters or, or uh, you, you know, bloggers or anybody who's working up any stories. Um, they each have a, a different viewpoint uh, of, of, of crime, uh, having worked in uh, Mr. Win Detective, Special Agent, uh, <laughs> um, Vin Vinny, uh, Mr. Winselowitz here, has, has uh, worked with the FBI. Uh, he worked uh, the FBI how many years? 20, 20 years uh, before retired and then going on to teach at Regis University. And then we have Ponzi, or Jim, <laughs> Who, who worked uh, 35 years for the Denver Police Department. Uh, and, and, and correct me if I'm, correct, uh, I'm wrong, but you, you, your precinct, or you led the precinct that covered North Denver? Well, I was a lieutenant, and I, I was in all of them but District 6 at one time. Okay, so, all right, so they kind of had you circling the uh, downtown I area. I from District 5, north, northeast. Northeast. North Okay, so as you can see, uh, each has each has a different perspective on the um, on, on law enforcement. So I'll just start with Vinny first. So Vinny, um, I understand that you worked undercover for the FBI in New York. Uh, j just just uh, f first off, just just curious, how do you get recruited to work undercover? Do they come to you and says, "Hey, you look mafioso. Let's <laughs> let's let's get you to go deep undercover, and uh, we'll have a backstory. And uh, you know, you went to the right high schools. You grew up in the right neighborhood. You could be the guy. Is that how it happened, or how does it actually happen? Yeah, don't you wish it was that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it is in my mind. <laughs> Here, let me see that. Here, I'll change it. Go for it. Okay. Uh, first of all, you would think that the federal government was that defined, but they're not. Uh, I, I want to put this in a little bit of context before I, uh, I can answer that question, but uh, when I joined the FBI in 1978, um, the undercover program was relatively new um, because a guy named J. Edgar Hoover did not believe that FBI agents should work undercover. So if, until Hoover died, we only had one significant undercover case where we had nine individuals that were out across the country and they were infiltrating things like the Students for a Democratic Society, the Ku Klux Klan, and some of the other, the Black Panthers, some of the other big movements. These guys were out there for years, basically, on their own. So from 72 until about 78, the FBI focused on uh, what we would concern property crimes. So fencing, uh, they had a whole bunch of operations that dealt with, um, we would buy stolen property, that kind of thing. 90% of the time, we used local police officers as the undercover agents because, again, it was the old tradition of, you know, that's kind of dirty work. We don't want FBI agents to do it. Uh, by the time I got into the uh, Bureau in 78, we were moving into uh, undercover operations in different fronts. And some of you will remember these little cases called abscam, um, public corruption within our government, congressmen taking money? Yes. Um, a quick side note about ad scam. Um, it was a property crime, and the informant came in and said, hey, listen, how would you like to uh, hook up with a couple congressmen? They're going to pay for somebody to become citizens. And uh, of course, we said yes, but we didn't have anybody from the Middle East and the FBI at that time. <clears throat> so we got. We had an agent, his name is Brian, Den uh, Mike Dennehy, who was Brian Dennehy's brother, the actor. A uh, guy from the Bronx, Bronx accent, accent, Irish guy, dressed him up as a sheik, but he couldn't talk. Because if you talk, everybody would know. You know, would be like, hey, how you doing? And it doesn't work. So he was the sheik, and we got another guy out of Cleveland who was Sicilian. 
And uh, John Legat, a little guy, and he was the sheik's translator. And he did all the interaction between the congressmen and they'd agree on a thing. And then what the congressman would do is, and you've all seen C-SPAN at two o'clock in the morning, somebody's reading somebody, something into the record. Well, that's what they would do. They'd say, John Smith is now a citizen of the United States, and they'd get their payoff, which was 50 grand at the time. But so, in the, in the context of undercover operations, we really didn't have a lot, and the budget was only like $350,000. The, uh, so when I went in, the last couple of weeks of the FBI Academy, they brought in different groups. They brought in people from organized crime and white collar crime and, you know, what, what are an area you want to specialize in? And they brought in some undercover guys, and I said, I think I want to do that, you know, uh, because... So you, were already, you went through the academy, you graduated from college, and you were in the Did. academy, and you thought, hey, that sounds pretty good. Yeah, so, okay. and then when I got back... Or you said, that sounds pretty good. I can't do that. Pretty good. I can't, okay. <laughs> so I ended up going back to New York, and they had a, um, they had a case, and um, they actually had a different guy that they wanted to go into the case, but when they told him who the subjects were, he decided he didn't want to go, he didn't want to do that. All right, so let's leave the audience okay. hanging on that. We're going to pick up on that story in a little bit. Uh, Jim, can you tell me a little bit about your career and uh, well, well, when you, uh, well, you, you served in, in the military, you, you're a Vietnam vet, thank you sir, for your service, um, and um, just, just tell us a little bit about how you got into the business and uh, what, what, you, what you experienced when you were there. Well, I was in Vietnam for 13 months, got out in January of 1970, and uh, had a few friends on the police department, and wasn't at first interested in it, but I, I uh, a real quick story, I used to live in an apartment building at Colfax and Pearl, which by the way, was $35 a month back then. Oh, God. <laughs> if you can believe that. Yeah, Long-term lease on that one, right? <laughs> <laughs> had a guy try to kick in my door one night, and there was an, uh, an officer named Don Rask that worked the all-night Safeway that some of you probably remember if you've been around Denver for a while. And he responded, and after, after we got to talk, and he said, why don't you go down and apply for the job? He said, I think you do a pretty good job here. So that's, that's the story about how I got on. And, uh, I love these stories of seeking truth and justice, <laughs> and it's like just just wanting to just <laughs> knock down the door of criminals. <laughs> but the the funny part was, after this guy tried to kick in the door, I had the chain on. So when I went out in the hallway, I had a shotgun with me, and Don Rask came up the stairs in full uniform. And I thought, I was really glad that we'd already met in the store, because he might have thought I was the bad guy. But So I, I spent 35 years on the job. I worked patrol, all but two years of that. I was on the street. I worked in internal affairs for two years. And uh, done about any, anything and everything a street officer does, never worked undercover. So, so uh, you, were, you worked Eternal Affairs uh, till when? Let's see, I was in there in 99, 98 to 2000. Okay, so did you uh, work on any uh, big cases uh, that we all might recognize? Um, that uh, uh, any, any uh, unjustified shootings or cover-ups or cops lying on the reports because they never do that right but I mean yeah I, I don't some of you may remember the um, you remember the Mina case where the, the Mina case uh, I do remember that the Mina case is, was a no-knock raid where basically the officers had a, a, a search warrant to to enter a home which without even knocking and they they showed up at this house they kicked in the door it was the wrong address the, the homeowner, the homeowner, when he saw armed men coming into their home, responded the way I guess a lot of people would do. He responded with a gun and they shot him dead. Okay, so so uh, that, that, was, that was a pretty big case that I remember and I, I wrote and, on it. And, and that, fact, isn't, that isn't the, the part I worked on. There, were, there was a, a um, neighborhood police officer then that you know, I hate to say that, that government people do anything wrong or the leadership of the department does anything wrong, 
but they were trying to get her to say that she'd gotten reports of drugs in that house, the one that they actually hit. And she came up to Internal Affairs, and I, I felt pretty good about that because she would only talk to me. So I did an investigation on what they tried to do to her, and uh, of course everybody was found innocent in the, in the long run, but uh, they, they, they didn't do anything to her, and that was the most important thing as far as what I did. Wow. Well, so, so uh, yeah, I would imagine that in, in, in a situation where you're basically investigating your comrades, uh, how difficult was that? You know what? It depends on the way you look at it. I also, you're, you're up there to try to find Snitch. the truth. <laughs> the truth about what happened. And nobody, of course, even an investigator wants to find a bad cop sure. doing something that he shouldn't. Of course. I also, through my investigations, cleared a lot of people that didn't do anything wrong. And that's your job up there. You don't just go after people and try to prosecute them. You try to, to, to find the ones that didn't, because we get some wild complaints up there, really wild stuff. And, and the department had a policy where they would not prosecute any, any victim, well, quote, victim that came up there and lied to the police about what actually happened. The department wouldn't prosecute them for false information. And that upset a lot of cops because when they got caught telling a lie, they were in big trouble. Different so, roles though, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, but, all right. So, so let me, let me, I'm going to come back to you, to come back to you because I want to hear about, about what, what you went on to do afterwards and then we're going to bring it into today. Uh, there's a lot of issues uh, that, that you all are still uh, very well aware of uh, and, and still on top of. But I wanted to hear from Vinny. I, I still can't, I can't, Vinny. <laughs> Vinny like is fun. <laughs> Vincent. Um, so, 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 so after you, after you, you um, uh, uh, decided you wanted to be undercover, there was a case that caught your eye. Tell us, tell well, it, or, 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 or uh, it, an investigation. There was a, it, there was a case that um, we had an opportunity to be involved in one of the biggest uh, fencing operations in New York City. What's fencing? Fencing is buying stolen property. Okay. So people would buy, uh, uh, steal stuff and then sell it. And the, the, the primary person involved was a guy named Jack Mace. Jack Mace, at the time I met him, was 78 years old. And so uh, the informant that I had uh, was a graduate of the Boston Winter Hill Gang, uh, Whitey Bulger, that group. He had done seven years in Atlanta and decided to work with DEA and then the FBI. So he knew these guys. So he introduced me to Jack and uh, Jack actually liked me and uh, took me under his wing as sort of his protege and I was going to take over his business. So he sent me all around the country. Um, wait, wait, wait a minute. Th these are members of the mafia that you're talking about. Uh, Jack is an associate. I got to meet the members right. through Jack because I was an earner with earner making money for the bad guys. So wait, wait. So, so, all right. So, so I want to just back up a little bit here because there's a little detail here uh, that, that fascinates me. And I don't know if, if you guys are fascinated, if it's fascinating for you guys, but I'm the one asking the question, so I'm going to do it. Go ahead. <laughs> all right. So, 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 so you're, you're in the FBI. Yeah. You go, yeah, I'm going to do undercover work. Right. That sounds great. And they're like, you know what, Vinny, you've got the right name. No, uh, you don't want to use your own name. Okay. Well, Go ahead. Can you can you share what your yeah, well I had Daguerre was? I had uh, several names, but uh, most of the time your first it, one. That's the one I'm I'm interested in right now. Is your very first Frank. name? Frank. Your name was Frank. 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 What? Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So Frank. So 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 you're you're in you're in the FBI. You're yeah. like yes, I want to do this. Like okay, your name is now Frank. Correct. All right. How do you make contact with these people? Well, the informant introduced me to Jack. Okay, so you had an informant. Okay. Yeah, we so had a guy comes in and says, hey, I know what's the... going on. There's some crazy mm -hmm. uh, dealings happening over here, and I want you to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, this is what's happening. So then he introduced you to a person. How, what, was, what was your backstory when you very first, when you very first went undercover? The, the, the back, it, it, it's interesting because now I'm going to only address New York City. Okay, I can't address other places. But in New York City, um, I was introduced by this guy, Billy, 
who used the name Billy Murphy. <laughs> they didn't use his real name. Billy, <laughs> Billy the name to get was Billy. Because nobody, no, nobody remembers their last name. Okay. Right. And nobody asked those questions. Okay. So what would happen is Billy introduced me to Jack Mace. Jack Mace was one of the biggest fences in the country at the time. And Jack liked me, so he started introducing me to all the mafia guys. You know, I'm a great guy, he knows me for years, this and that and the next thing. So, so I mean, I'm just trying to, trying to just piece together because, I mean, there's a moment when you're in it's, the mop. All of a sudden, they, he introduces you. How did, what was that meaning like? Where was it? I mean, was it, it, was it? It's an interesting thing because there's an, there, it's an untold thing. Um, what happens is this. I'm going to invite you to meet my friend Jim. Jim, who's Nam de Guerra's okay. Jim, right? Okay. All right. All right. If Jim turns out to be a cop or does damage to the group, you get to kill not only Jim, but you can kill me too. Sure, of because course. Because I That's made the until, introductions. Yeah. You're, you're, yeah. Um, the lucky piece of this for us was the fact that uh, John Gotti, who was involved in the crew that I was involved with, was vacant because his kid was killed in a uh, car accident. A deliver delivery truck driver killed his kid. And so he would drink all the time. So his brother Eugene ran the group along with this other guy, Angelo Ruggiero. So when John, at the end of the case, after about three years, when we started to make arrests, John decided that he was going to take over the Gambino family. So he killed most of our subjects. You know, Frankie De Chica, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you, you were, so, but, but weren't you in competing gangs there? Um, or or I com was, competing families? You know, Everybody had their own, if you look at it as territorial, and, and probably the, uh, the, the movie Goodfellas is good, but The Sopranos is even better. These people don't leave their neighborhoods. They don't leave six, seven blocks from where they live. So if they're operating in Manhattan, they operate in Manhattan. If they operate in lower Manhattan, they're in lower Manhattan. So they don't really travel between areas. And the, it's New York City. There's enough crime and enough greed to go around that you don't have to move too far to get that to happen. So, so was it a cafe? Was it a corner? Was it was no? It was a place like car? this. <laughs> it, oh, really? it, it's a social club, you know. Upstairs, downstairs, had a little bar, you know. Uh, played a lot of pinochle. Well, that was the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club, and I always thought it was funny because. None of these guys, and, and I don't know the stories back in New York anymore, but hunting and fishing for them would be going to the meat section of Safeway, okay? I, I don't know. I think that may have been sending a message to other would-be uh, informants. <laughs> they, they hunt, they'll hunt you, and they'll have to fish you out of the Hudson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there weren't too many elk in New York, right? <laughs> no, no. Right. I didn't see an elk in New York. No. So it was a social club. So you walk in and, and you... Well, you have to go in with somebody. Otherwise, they're going to ask you to leave. And once right. you're in, you're in. I you're mean, in. once you're introduced around. And, and, and it's, it's always a matter of the question is, who are you with? Okay. Okay? Okay. So I was with Jack, this guy Jack. Everybody knew Jack. Jack was seven, like I said, So Billy introduced you to Jack. And yeah. then, then Jack was your, right. I guess, your patron or, or your oh, yeah. benefactor. He spent half of his life in jail. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to tell this little story. So we're sitting in, we're sitting, uh, Jack hung out mostly at, uh, in the Diamond District. So I had an apartment in the Diamond District because he didn't want me driving all the way to Queens, you know, those kind of things. But anyway, Jack is sitting there, he says, you know, he says, when I was in Atlanta, every day the FBI would come and they'd ask me the same freaking questions. I'm going to clean it up a little bit. But you, you can change the words wherever you want. That's the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. Yeah. So he's in there, and the FBI is questioning because he got put in on a scam in which uh, the, head of the, of the, um, the head of the Philadelphia fa family, Bruno, asked Jack, to get them five million dollars worth of negotiable securities so they could give them to a banker so the banker could collateralize a loan for a politician's brother. So, what does Jack say? Sure, I'll do that. So he gets a friend of his to pull five million dollars of negotiable securities out of IBM, out of their vault, gets on a plane, flies down to uh, Florida, gets in a cab, meets a guy in the back of the cab, 
This is sounding like a real official business deal, isn't it? Hands him a paper bag full of $5 million worth of negotiable securities. The guy hands him an envelope of $50,000. So Jack then gets back on the plane and he flies to Philadelphia and he goes to see Bruno. Because normally you never tell anybody how much money you made or lost. But in this case, everybody knew it was 50 grand. So Jack went to Bruno and he said, look, I just made 50 grand here. You know, what, what piece do you want? And Bruno says, ah, nothing. We just wanted to do a friend for somebody. We wanted to do a favor for a friend, meaning the politician's brother. So he says, they ask me about that every day. And you'd think I'd tell them, and I'm going, God, I hope I'm on here. I hope the microphone's working. You know, and it was, the banker was this guy named, and some of you may remember the name, a guy named Bibi Rebozo. And the politician was a guy named Richard Nixon. It was his brother. Um, so they never caught them for it because the, BB then took the money, uh, took the negotiable securities and sold them off, and then collateralized the loan with cash. And as far as he was concerned, he didn't, I don't remember where that stuff went. But it was too late for us to do it. You know, there was no jurisdictional. But that's the type of circles these, yeah, it's, these guys it's, would, it's, it, it's would be in. Yeah, right, yeah. no, it, it's gotta be oh, terrifying. But I wanna get, I wanna, I wanna get back to, to Jim's uh, story. Uh, and uh, as far as, you know, patrolling, patrolling the, um, the the streets and working in, in internal affairs. What uh, what what what's was most memorable out of your you know 35 years uh, here on the streets of Denver and also in the internal affairs office? I know the Mena case was huge, and and I, I remember the 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 search warrant became point of contention about who knew what when. I mean, and what. How did they get the wrong address on the search warrant? I know that was huge. And then to right now hear the backstory, because for us, the story broke. We wrote it. We went a little deeper. Some allegations of, well, some very horrendous allegations that came came after that, which we didn't report, but we we knew about, but we didn't we couldn't get solid information on it. And we didn't want to slander anyone or, or libel someone. Well the, well, the problem with some of that stuff at the time was that it, it was going to be a court case, so there was, there was a lot of things they couldn't have told you anyway, even if they were trying to hide some things that, that I think they were at the time, definitely. But the, as Vinny knows from working undercover, you don't lose sight of the person that's making a buy or whatever. So the person that made the buy, the, the backup officer lost sight of. And that's how they ended up at the wrong house in the first place. And, and they, what they did was they, they counted the houses in the alley and it didn't look the same on the other side of the, when they counted them from the front, there, there was a garage, there, there was something there that, that threw the count off. Oh, wow. And that, that's how they, and most unfortunately for Mr. Mina, for sure. And the, the problem was, I don't know if you remember, uh, Peter Boyle's radio show back then, but I do. he's the one that really broke that whole thing because nobody, and when I was up in internal affairs, I'm thinking, you're not gonna be able to hide any of this. Somebody's gonna find out what happened. And, and somebody called Peter is I think what happened. And then once he started hammering it on his radio show, then a lot more of the details came out. And so it was, uh, it did, was a tough time for... Did, did you feel that any criminal charges should have been filed in that case against any of the police officers involved? No. The ones that went, actually went in the house? The, actual, or the, the, ones ones who, that, the ones who actually went into the house? No, because when you, when you charge into a house like that and you think you're in the correct place and somebody comes down the stairs with a firearm and you, 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 I mean, you're convinced you're in the right spot, so what do you, you're going to defend yourself. That's what... I'm sure that was what was in those officers' minds at the time that that happened. Okay. That's because a lot of this information came out later, and they certainly didn't know. I mean, common sense would tell you they wouldn't hit a house and shoot somebody if they knew it was the wrong one. So when they went in, they, they believed they were being attacked by whoever they were looking for in there. So no mens rea against Mina. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help it. Sorry. 
<laughs> okay. That's pretty good. That was good. Okay. That was good. You can say it. All right. He's been around too long. <laughs> All right, so so uh, so you you retired from the Internal Affairs Department. That was your that was your last position there, or no, did you go on? No, what, I what? left there in 2000 and went out to District Five, which is I told you Northeast Denver, and I was out there till I retired. Okay. So about 10 or 12 years. So so that area is that. Uh, Montbello. Montbello. Okay. okay. Green Valley Ranch. Okay. And when I first got it, went, well, the, the station, District 2 used to work District 5. They didn't have a station out there at the time. So the, everybody would report to District 2, and then they'd send two or three cars out there. And when I first went out there, you could stand at Peoria and see almost nothing looking east. Now if you go out there, there you, there's houses and businesses as far as you can see. So it was quiet at the beginning. When I came on in 73, things were a lot different than they are now. Oh, absolutely. 18, Pardon? 1873. <laughs> that could have been close to, because I was on before you, so. <laughs> but uh, worked through the, the Pope's visit, the Summit of Eight, all that was, uh, Big time street office. So, Summit of eight was back when the large economic powers only consisted of eight. Now it's the G20. There's some, you know, there's 20 countries that are now part of this. But back then it was the G8. Um, uh, just, just for background. Uh, and there was just a lot of prep for that because the, the things that had happened in other cities, even in Europe, when the protest, when, when the, yeah, when those summits showed up or. Uh, there are people that didn't even like the Pope's visit. So there was a lot of... Uh, Wait a minute, people didn't like the Pope's visit? Yeah, there what? was... A, they <laughs> thought he was getting too much attention. So said, well, you know, people have been... Who? We had a Pope that was shot, so... <laughs> but were there, were there protests for the Pope? I don't... I mean, were there people... No, no formalized No protests, formalized, okay. You okay. talked to people on the street that didn't like the fact that he was there and that we were causing so much tax money to keep them safe and, and they couldn't get to job or to work because there were too many people in the streets. And that was 1996. It was, it yeah. was a, lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot of stuff going on. Then we, of course, worked the two Super Bowl wins by the Broncos running through downtown Denver with gas masks on, okay. you know, trying to keep everybody from tearing the place up. So it was... Uh, I think I think your boys gassed me after the Stanley Cup. <laughs> I think I think I think I, I, I wasn't sure what, what it was. What were you until doing? I was I was covering the news, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, and uh, I remember Captain Collier when the, with, with one of those operations down there. He everybody's got a gas mask on. He's walking around with nothing on. And there wasn't that much gas at the time, but everybody's looking at him like, why is everybody else wearing a gas mask and you're not? But we, just a quick story about the downtown mall, and this was really upsetting to the police department when they allowed them to destroy the police memorial down at headquarters. If that were a, an operation going on the 16th Street Mall, we'd have been fighting them all. They actually had to chain the door shut at headquarters to keep people, protesters, from getting inside. What year was that? They were, that was just a few years was ago. That during the DNC? Uh, or no, that was, no the, that, was that was the one right outside the current. Okay. The okay. Police memorial out okay. front, okay. and they were ordered not to do anything. Just let them do it, and we'll clean it up later. You know that, that that you know. I wanna I wanna I wanna uh, get to some of the work that you're doing, and also open up the uh, questions to the to the pa panel. Um, yeah, what, what you're just describing sounds like it's a, a change in police tactics when when we're when it comes to crowd control. Uh, you're talking about active shooters. Well, or? not yet, not yet. What you're talking about as far as um, confronting crowds as opposed as opposed or or containing crowds, if that makes sense uh, to, to people because there's there has been a change in, in that type of policing where 
Uh, I, we saw it during the 2008 DNC where you had these crowds coming in, uh, 3,000 people coming out of the Coliseum uh, without a permit, and by all rights, police had every legal right to round them up and ship them out and tear gas them and what have you. But, I mean, there, there has been a change, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, they're, they're, they're doing a lot more proactive stuff now with the Jersey barriers. If, if people that don't know what those are, they're the big concrete blocks that they link together to p keep vehicles from being able to drive through and to keep people out of where they're not supposed to be. And if it's a building that may be a target, they'll, they'll keep people, well, depending on what the threat is, they have methods of keeping people away from that building through environmental means rather than having a line of police officers there trying to keep them from getting through. It was the, the concrete maze outside right. of the of the uh, Pepsi Center during the DNC. I want to, I want to, um, no, you, on, on the DNC piece, uh, I think what's important to realize here. is, uh, thank you, on the DNC piece, what's important to realize is that the, the business people, the downtown community mobilized it, like they had never done before. So they were able to communicate building to building, uh, different building owners, secu private security people, and so on and so forth, and helped the police department. There was a couple of instances where there was a feign of a bunch of people gathering in front of you know one of the buildings downtown, and the, the building guys were saying, there's nobody here. I mean, that kind of communication and that kind of participation with the community and the police department was what I think made the DNC more successful here in Denver sure. than and Chicago. And also, well, I mean, also there was communication between the, uh, the police yeah. and the organizers of these uh, events and, and what they would call street theater. Well, in the Columbus Day Parade, yeah, we, too. we had right. massive preparation for those for a long time, and it, it kind of died out after a while. Well, actually, the Italian group that was putting them together just said, hey, we're just not going to do it anymore. So, so both uh, Ponzi and Winsilowicz have, have done uh, training uh, on active shooters, uh, which is something that is very uh, timely. Uh, we're going to get to that, but there's one last story that I want to hear from <laughs> Vinny, Frank, Frank. <laughs> a.k.a. Frank. Um, so, uh, Frank. <laughs> While you were in the mob, uh, th there was an interesting case. Uh, you know, the, the fencing and the stolen goods w would involve a wide range of things. Is that right? So, so kind of give us an idea of how, how the mob, a common way of the mob made money. It was it's sort of like in Goodfellas. I, I, you know, can you just kind of explain uh, how, how that worked? Yeah, let, there, there's a couple of, I don't know if... Uh, if uh, I'm, I'm going to guide you to I that. I know where you want to go. I'm going to guide you to that, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> just, I know where you want to go. Just come so. along. Just, 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 I'll just slide don't over give away. Don't direction. give it away. <laughs> but uh, well, one of the things yeah. is, I want you all to think about, what do you think is the, is the best thing to hijack? If you Cigarettes. were a bad guy, what would you want to hijack? Cigarettes. No. Meat. No? Meat. Cash. <laughs> Kimball Clark products. Oh, like the uh, like you the know what Kimble adult diapers? Huh? Paper towels, toilet paper, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Wow. A truckload of Kimball Clark toilet paper could be sold for over twenty thousand dollars, and that's cheaply at a flea market. Okay. Now think about this: two mob guys approach the guy in the truck and say. Get out of the truck, we're going to take the truck. The guy knows he's driving paper around. Take the truck, okay? Then they report it to the New York City Police Department. What was in the truck? Toilet paper. Oh yeah, that's going right to the top of our list. So as a result, I mean, this is again, you want to study what's not going to bring you heat, as it were. So that was the biggest moneymaker, and they all thought I had, um, that I had outlets in um, various places throughout the United States. And we actually had an undercover agent um, who came from Mobile, who spent his entire FBI career driving a tractor trailer. And if he didn't look like a, and sound like a redneck, believe me, he did. Frank, okay. Frank, let me, let me ask you go something. Go ahead, you want to go to the... I wanna, no, I want to ask you something. Toilet paper is untraceable unless it's used. 
<laughs> then you've got, then you got DNA. You, you got a good DNA sample right there. Did you ever steal a truck? No, I never did. Did you after? Did you ever get close to being asked to cap a guy? No. Okay. I did um, have to push a guy around, but that's different. <laughs> okay. Was that was that a common occurrence, or was that just one time? No. It, it, there, it's like anything else, you've got to sort of assert yourself in certain areas, but you don't want to assert yourself with... Uh, one of the guys that came into the social club was a guy named Sammy the Bull. Sammy the Bull was the guy that... Gravano? Real, yes. Okay. He was the guy that actually uh, testified against John Gotti and got him convicted. And Sammy took the government deal, did probation, did a short time in jail, but they tend not to be able to stay out of the limelight, okay? Sammy didn't drink, worked out every day, okay, but would kill you in a heartbeat. You don't pick a fight with Sammy the ball. All right. You know? Well, that's So, that's I mean, good. but there are other people that are sort of in between that you may want to push around. So, so you stayed clean except for a minor assault, right? <laughs> yeah, just okay. a minor assault. <laughs> okay, misdemeanor, not a felony. Yeah. So, so with stealing trucks, now, uh, I imagine that's, that while you're targeting paper, uh, there was an instance where, uh, you know, there was another product that you ended up with. Can you, can you, can you, can yeah, you share Yeah, actually, that? That, that, that product's being well documented, not only in print, but here tonight, okay? Um, what happened was, is that we had a guy up in, um, uh, one of the mob guys in Buffalo, and he was stealing Cabbage Patch Kid trucks. Which, by the way, are traceable. Now, now, now let, me, let, me just, let me just put that in the context here. I mean, Cabbage Patch, back in, back in the day, in around 83, they were super rare. They were like the it toy that you have. I mean, pic picture the, the, the PS4s, how they, are, how they fly off the shelves, and it's like the top must-have gift uh, that you need to get for Christmas, and, and you can't get a PS4. So this would be the equivalent of that circa 1983. Uh, you couldn't get the tick, tickle me. Elmo had the same kind of phenomenon some years did, back, yeah. and then you know, just it's like the it toy where they just fly off the shelves. You can't get them, and your kid super wants them, and it's like craze. Suburban moms scratching each other's eyes out in in the, in, in stores because uh, the the kid has to have it. So, so this is what we're talking. We're, we're talking about a very it toy at the time, Cabbage Patch Kids, which are tra which are what you want to. Okay. She's so, agreeing with you. Oh, okay. All right. So, uh, so uh, uh, anyway, so that Cabbage Patch dolls. So, so what happens is basically that we, we end up buying the Cabbage Patch dolls, okay, my, myself and Davey. Davey actually drove them. Um, and at the time, believe it or not, I was truly a New York City guy because the meeting was going to be in Rochester. And I figured, how far is Rochester from New York City? I'm going to get in the car and drive there in a couple of hours in the middle of a snowstorm, et cetera, et cetera. It took me two days to get to freaking Rochester. <laughs> but we made the deal. Davey took the, the Cabbage Patch things away, and the local FBI office, because I would not be in on the arrest, came and arrested this mob guy. And the guy says, what are you here for? You know, he figured, you know, re labor racketeering, you know, any of these other big things he was doing. And they said, for the stolen pa uh, Cabbage Patch kids. He says, the dollies? He says, take the effing dollies. He says, I don't care, but leave me here. You know, unfortunately, he couldn't do that. You know, so. So, you're, so the mob was the reason why my niece didn't get a Cabbage Patch doll That's it. in That's it. Oh, my God. OK. That's it. Yeah, yeah. you know what? Let, I'm going to open up. I'm, there, there's, there's some of the work. I'm gonna, let's open up the questions now about, the, about their careers. Uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll take the conversation to uh, some very you know, uh, in the now uh, uh, work that they're doing. Let me borrow this real quick. So, okay, I'll have it. Wait, 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 wait. So, the Cabbage Patch crime. You've got a container ship coming in to probably Newark, right? Offloading container, you know, big boxes. They go on the back of trucks. Where do the mob guys boost it? When it's on the truck, and then what do they do with it? When it's hooked to the truck. In other words, uh -huh. <laughs> what does boost mean? <laughs> oh, okay, got gotcha. Boost means steal. Okay, got okay. it. Yeah, I got it. Uh, I'm sorry. One, I'm of, the, one of the hard. things that's interesting is, is that for the FBI to be involved in anything like that, it has to have an interstate nexus. So you've got to be able to figure out how this, whatever it is, is going to impact interstate commerce. 
Um, it, it sometimes is as um, difficult as um, the mob guys are bringing fuel in from Jersey across the George Washington Bridge into Manhattan, and that's the commerce nexus. In this particular case, I forget where the dolls were made, but they were transported between states. These guys uh, took the, um, the truck someplace in, in New York on one of the highways and then drove them up to Buffalo, and that's where they were trying to sell them. And then Jack, whose paramour was from Rochester, said, hey, you, you want to buy some of these dolls? He says, you know, the guy is selling them. And, and that's how we got involved. It, was, it, it seems simple, but it's not, you know. Any other questions regarding working for the mob or working here in Denver, internal affairs? All right. Uh, Professor Ponzi, I got a question about Denver. Uh, back in the mid-90s, you had the, uh, the Ku Klux Klan trying to upstage Martin Luther King Day. Uh, now, in uh, recent times, we have uh, little alt-right fights going on and uh, demonstrations, as well as some uh, very interesting anti-fascist demonstrations running around uh, downtown Denver. Do you have any insights for us on how these extremist or fringe groups work? Uh, their internal dynamics. I mean, where, where do they come from? How does this, uh, how does this happen? Hmm. I'm not, you're, you're asking me how they get together? We're, I don't have a lot of insight on that other than, you know, the kind of stuff that uh, is, is fairly common. They're, people live in certain areas. They, they form certain political beliefs. I mean, there are people that believe the Holocaust didn't happen, that, you know, we did 9-11, all that kind of stuff. And I think what's really helped foster that is the Internet. Because you can go on the Internet right now and you can find a group of people that believe whatever you do, no matter how outlandish or ridiculous it is, you can find, and, and when you can find a group like that, then you start telling yourself, well, maybe what I believe isn't so bad, because look, here, here's a bunch of other people that believe the same thing. So I think the, the internet and the rapid spread of information, as opposed to the way it was 30 or 40 years ago, brings these kind of groups together, and then they, you know, they form clubs, they meet, and they, they plan operations based on what they believe. Is that kind of what you were talking about? Um, you ask. I, I was fishing, I was just seeing what Were you thinking maybe there was a social club where they were all gathering? <laughs> you know, uh, one of the things that's, uh, you know, I, I think we started, is it's an interesting conversation because in the 90s, we did not have until about 1993 hate crime legislation. It didn't happen until we started burning churches down or people were burning churches down in the South. I mean, lots of churches, lots of people getting hurt. and. It wasn't just the black community. It was synagogues, it was other groups, and we, for the first time, meaning the government, decided that these are hate crimes. People are hating each other. So how do we dig into that hate? There's a lot of TV programs, reality programs. I used to be a uh, Ku Klux Klan member. I'm now revived. You know, it's a mental, you, you know, it's a position that people are taking and whether they're prejudiced against race, uh, religion, or whatever it is, it it's, gets so ingrained that they cannot see the other side. And as a result, uh, it, it's like anything else. If you don't have any tools to fix something, you use the only tool you have, which is a hammer, and in their case, it's violence. So it's, it's kind of a sad thing. Okay, one more, or a couple more. As many as we need. That's right. Okay, here's a good one. First, a little trivia f for you, Vinny. Your buddy Mike Dennehy? Yeah. His dad worked for the Associated Press for 30 years on the general desk in New York. Peter and I, you know. Oh, you knew him from then? No, no, no. no we didn't no, know him because I, he's, I, he's an old guy. Press, yeah, we're both AP guys. Him, yeah. Okay, so Brian, before he hit it big in the movies, uh -huh. was a bartender, which was basically, now excuse me, a cop bar. 
Which, in the cop, C O P. Which uh -huh. meant that if you were in law enforcement, you were probably drinking there until two, three o'clock in the morning. Uh -huh. Large quantities of adult beverages. That wouldn't happen. Yeah. yeah. In <laughs> fact, I think the name of the place was. No, I'm not going to say the name. But it had animals in it. This New York City. Was it, it your fifty animal, rock? And they would shoot the eyeballs out of these animals. And uh -huh. then somebody go fix them, and then, you know. That's nice. The animals were dead. Anyway, your buddy Mike used to work. Good, for yeah. <laughs> yeah, Brian and, um, uh, Brian and uh, Mike, I remember going to their mom's funeral okay. up in the Bronx. All right, so, so here's the question. You, you were in the FBI. Yes. And working, trying to infiltrate the, uh, the mob at a really interesting time in the FBI's history with the mob. In 1984... Well, in 1983, actually, the mob managed to, to do a black bag job in a safe house in Boston and get in Jerry Angiulo's house and, and for the first time tape a ceremony where guys were getting made. And that broke the New England mob. And I could see it from where, where I grew up, was controlled by the New England mob. I could see the, not just the culture of my hometown change, but the economy of my hometown change like that because they broke the mob. Cocaine was not being dealt at on the streets of, of my hometown in 1983. It was being dealt everywhere in 1984 because the mob disappeared. Talk to me about how your colleagues dealt with that change where they instantly disassembled one entire family. Well, it, it, they really didn't. Um, you know, it, it's kind of like they, they did a really good job for years monitor, monitoring the mob and not understanding the mob, I would say from the early 70s. Hoover didn't believe there's anything called organized crime. Okay, so we, the FBI existed for a long time saying there was no organized crime. It's not until Valachi and some of these other Italian mobsters that get caught come forward and actually testify about operations in the mob and so on and so forth. But um, I, I remember the black job, bag job that you're talking about. They actually, they actually recorded that ceremony with the card and the pricking your finger and all this other stuff. Um, and in New York, what they did was um, they decided they were going to go off after the, the top people in the mob. The, the concept was you cut the head off of the snake. So at the time that I was undercover, Paulie Castellano was in charge of the uh, Gambino family. And uh, Paulie, um, it, you, you want to talk about ingenuity. They put a, a wiretap in Paulie's house in the leg of his kitchen table. Why? Why, Jim? You're Italian. Everybody spends time in the kitchen. And that's where all the deals were made, in the kitchen. Now, the Irish, uh, they, they, they've got other places they do that at. But the bottom line is, is that they picked apart the top people, that, and, and then when John Gotti came along, of course, Paulie Castellano looked like he was going to cooperate, so they killed him. You know, they, uh, that's an early retirement thing. Um, but yeah, I think it, it, it's kind of interesting, because years, for years, the mob would deny working in drugs. You know, we don't do drugs, that kind of thing. And, and the FBI did not have any insight because we didn't work drugs until, I think, 85. That's right when that happened. Yeah. And then we started, we got jurisdiction for drugs, and then all of a sudden people wanted me to go out and buy drugs instead of Cabbage Patch Kids. You could see it in Rhode Island. It was cocaine. Yeah. I, this is, this is, when we first started working drugs, uh, Billy and I hooked up with a guy in Tarpon Springs, Florida. I, I never met this guy, you know, but he knew I was connected in New York, and he sold me 40 kilos of cocaine. Then we went to, we went, Jack sent us on a trip, we went out to Los Angeles, we met some guys in a bar, we bought 245 kilos of cocaine. Uh, it, it, it's short-lived. Once they, once we get the drugs, it's kind of over. And then the the last case, the the mob guys were going to sell us 20 kilos of cocaine every other week. And um, it 
it was just too, flu too fluid out there with drugs. And it wasn't until you start breaking down the organized crime that that, that stopped. Could you speak to organized crime in Denver? No. And I, I'm going to tell you the truth, the whole truth or nothing but the truth about Denver. Oh, too close to The home. Denver organized crime was not large enough to attract the attention of the FBI and FBI headquarters. I know that you had a small group of people out here. What, what about Gaetano's? Huh? They Never mind. Didn't do it. <laughs> didn't do it. Just didn't raise to the level of, I mean, you got you to remember at the time that the FBI was attacking organized crime, we're talking Chicago, New York, LA. These are big places. These are Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Youngstown, Ohio. I mean, people are killing each other. They're blowing each other up. Um, you didn't have any of that out here. Not to the extent that they had it back there. Jim? Jim? You want to talk about oh. your cousin? <laughs> <laughs> oh, are, is there a relation? Is there a relation? Well, he, you know why he said that? Because my Ponzi. Last, yeah, my, yeah, he, yeah there was a Ponzi The Ponzi and Ponzi known. scheme, yeah, you're right. No, everyone, everyone's probably wondering, is There's there a relation? There's also a Ponzi scheme. Right, uh, uh, yes. Yeah, so I, I'm into the banking industry, too. <laughs> And the, the, I don't know uh, why they don't call it Madoff, the Madoff scheme. But, <laughs> the pyramid but. stuff. No, we honestly didn't have much to do. A lot of that was Northwest Denver, and th th that wasn't the type of crime that police deal with. The, the FBI and people like that, were, you know, they needed to get do undercover operations. And they're, they, the street vice people that worked in Denver probably bought dope from some of those people, but as far as any large-scale operation, not really, not in Denver. Did they do numbers here? Pardon? Did they, do, did they run numbers here? Yeah, I think everybody did numbers. I mean, that's the easiest racket. Yeah, I think everybody did numbers. I'll yeah. tell you a funny story about that. Somebody was almost my father-in-law way back in the, before I went to Vietnam. He, I can't use names here. <laughs> Anyway, he, uh, he, he had a numbers thing going, and he... What's numbers? Oh, yes, good question. Sorry. Is good <laughs> what is question. numbers? Yes, what is numbers? In New York City... It's before the lottery and in New York City, gambling. But. It was the attendance... This is one of the numbers. It was the attendance at Aqueduct Racetrack, the last three digits. So if they had 20,478, 478 was the number. You paid the gambling. It was, lot, lot, it was the lotto. It was the lotto before yeah, the state. Buck. The state took it over. But uh. yeah, you, you paid a buck to your bookie. Okay, right. so usually in the barber shop or someplace. And then if you won, okay, you could hit it one to a hundred per buck. But I mean, you know, people would spend more money than a dollar. Right. Uh, Billy, the guy that I worked with, thank you. Um, well, my name is Billy. He was a bookie in Florida. <laughs> And he used to always say, I collect on Tuesday, I pay off on Wednesday. Why? Because he didn't have any cash. He was getting his cash from the money of the people that owed him the money on Tuesday, and then paying off on Wednesday. So anyway, so, he was going through his numbers, and, and he, he just happened to look out the window, and he saw a police car pull up to the curb and park. And the guy comes walking up and knocks on the door. Well, he panics and throws everything into his fireplace. He answers the door, and the cop says, you're parked more than a foot away from the curb. You need to go out and move your car. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. All right, so. True oh, story. I just want to make one more point. There's a big distinction. You know, police departments will talk about working undercover. Police departments will talk about working undercover. Normally speaking, their undercover agents go home every night, or they even sometimes go back to their station house or district office. You go undercover with the FBI, you're undercover for anywhere between six months and 18 months, for sure. You don't go any place. You don't go to your office, you don't go home. You have a different identity. You live a separate life for that period of time. God, I wish I did, but I didn't. But you don't have to take any vacation. Hey, you know? So I worked in New York uh, for three years with the mob and then three years with white-collar crime, high-end confidence scheme. 
and then three years in a public corruption case. And the public corruption case was one with Rudy Giuliani, as I'd like to say, when he had hair. And before he ran for mayor, he was the uh, Southern District's United States Attorney. Um, and then got out of that and was a supervisor and then went down to headquarters and ran the undercover unit down there. So when I retired, we were doing all of the covert operations for the Bureau. And if you remember, I said in the beginning when I first went undercover, we had a budget in the FBI of about $350,000 for undercover operations. When I retired, it was $12 million plus. That's a lot of money, you know, which you all pay. And one of the problems I'm sure Vinny can attest to is uh, sometimes they become friends. You know, it makes it really hard to do whatever they have to do because they're with them every, all the time, everywhere, and they, they develop a friendship, and it makes it really hard to, you know, end up turning them in when it's all over with. Yeah, yeah, uh, Professor uh, W. Uh, I, I would like to, I would like to uh, ask you to clarify your belief that J. Edgar Hoover did not believe organized crime existed uh, until about what the 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 seventies. Yeah, the seventies. Okay, yeah. that I I find that very hard to believe. I mean, the Kennedys were trying to bust organized crime in the early sixties. During World War II, uh, Benito Mussolini was very thorough in trying to suppress organized crime, and that meant. Um, um, that meant American intelligence uh, pushed, used uh, the mafia as a weapon against Mussolini during their invasion of Italy. Um, it, and they even used the mafia to patrol uh, the American coastline to uh, act as an extra security force. Well, they, I just don't find it credible that J. Edgar Hoover was unaware of this. I mean, was he acting? Is that another pose of going on? Is they, well, there's, there's two answers for you. First answer is yes. We did use every asset that we could during World War II, et cetera. Lucchese was brought back from exile from Italy to work the docks and keep people on the docks during World War II. But J. Edgar Hoover didn't, he believed in these factions, but he did not believe that there was this organized crime in which there was a boss, an underboss, captains, crews, and soldiers that were all working towards a criminal enterprise, whatever that was. Um, it wasn't until the end of his, well, even until 72 when he died, that, that he just didn't have, we didn't have organized crime. We had violent crime, we had bad guys, but we didn't have the concept that there was five families in New York, two families in Philadelphia, that kind of thing. I don't know if that answers your question, but. But there, but there was, just to clarify, there, there weren't jurisdictions that were investigating but exactly the correct. FBI. Now, the they FBI did. did the, the they, their investigations in the FBI prior to 72 really were based on subversive groups in the United States that they could identify, like the Students for a Democratic Society, the uh, Ku Klux Klan, the Black Panthers. I'm missing one. Uh, that's the Students for a Democratic uh, Society. Anti war protesters. The Weathermen. The Weathermen, that's it. So what we did is we actually put people into these situations. We had a guy in, um, a very colorful individual named Willie Reagan, who went undercover in California and lived in a commune in Canada for seven years and then came back to California and lived in a commune and was able to stop the murder of a number of school superintendents and the bombing of schools in LA because uh, he told me he knew how to make a bomb, okay? Um, very colorful guy, okay, but, so, all right, so we yeah. have another question from Susanna. I'm Susanna Spear, and I cover the Denver private investigator industry. We're just the sort of Colorado, Rocky sure. Mountain region. Yeah. And there was a recently um, Rule 8.4C, and that was just added to the Colorado bar, and it um, basically says that lawyers can have private investigators do undercover work for them. Um, because lawyers aren't supposed to work that way and sort of gave them legal permission to do that. And I'm wondering if you could um, speak about that and also just in general using private investigators to do 
undercover work um, when a, as just a, a strategy of solving a case? Um, you know, the, there's two different things. One is, when I was working undercover and committing crimes, <clears throat> I had a, an exemption from the Attorney General of the United States for every crime that I committed, which means that I'm not going to be arrested for bribery, buying of stolen property, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so governmental agencies get those exemptions for their employees, and even if it's after the fact, and what I mean after the fact is, uh, I went to a meeting to buy tomato soup and the guy is selling me drugs. Well, I might not have had the exemption for drugs at that point. They're gonna go and give me that exemption. When you use a private investigator, and I'm associate, not associated with the group, but I know the group that you're talking about, I know that this, this whole uh, push for private investigation to be licensed in Colorado is pretty recent. And you can always use a ruse. I mean, you know, if I want to say I'm Jim Ponzi and I go to the door and I say, you know, I've come here to check your, uh, your house or so on, um, or get information from you, it's up to the citizen to either give the information or not. Um, I'm not really in favor of ruses unless they're going to lead you directly to evidence um, either that's going to exonerate or convict you in some way. But it's an, interesting, it's an interesting point. I mean, does anybody here believe that law enforcement is not able to lie? Uh, they're able to. Uh, the, qu the question is, are they allowed to? Yes, they are. I can lie. I can lie about a lot of stuff. If I arrest somebody, I can lie about the process. I can tell Jim that his partner, Don Lindley, has already given him up and uh, Donna's going to get probation and you're going to jail. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things there. The, the, right, right. Or, or, or the he had a gun, I was afraid for my life, right? That's a common I don't one. give them up. All right. Jim, Jim, is there anything you'd like to add on this, on this question, on whether or not it's, it's, it's proper or appropriate for a um, uh, lawyer's investigator to go undercover? I mean, it seems almost as you can, you can sway it either way. I mean, if there, I mean, if there, I mean, I'm not familiar with this, with this, or whether or not there are specific rules, protocols. Uh, as that far you need as to... lawyers, well, I, I remember a case. Um, geez, I'm, it's a little right? bit Susanna foggy Anderson, now, but we used the example okay. in class a couple of times. We had a lawyer. We had a, a and this was in Denver. You, maybe you remember this. It had a a shooter, I believe it was in a Walmart or a grocery store that had victims in there and he said he, he was going to shoot everybody unless he got to talk to a prosecutor. Was that a Ray case? Was that the, was that 97? I think I seem to recall that. Yeah, yeah and I, I'm, it's a little hazy now, yeah. but the, anyway, the attorney went in and, and told him a story, told him he was a defense attorney rather than a prosecutor. Right. And, and listened to what he had to say, and he got sanctioned for that. He did, and they tried to overturn the, uh, the conviction based on the evidence that he collected right. at the time. And that actually stood, Paul, if I remember Paul, correctly. It was Paul, Paul Treep. I can't remember the name, but it was a little bit before I, before I got to Denver. So but they, let's, they do have rules like that in, in some cases think, where I think the other piece of this that's important is attorneys do, not, attorneys do not want to collect direct evidence in any way. They would rather have somebody collected for them and represented in court because otherwise they then become a witness. So let's say, for instance, I'm investigating for um, a law firm, Berg Sinsom, and, and, I, and I have done some, um, some side work for some people. What's going to happen is I'm going to do an investigation. I'm going to turn the investigation over to the attorneys. The attorneys are going to decide whether or not they want to use that information in court. And then they're going to get you or somebody, you know, somebody that worked on that piece to testify. But the idea is that you know, if you're going to get a private investigator to go out and do this information, whoever it is is going to have to testify, yeah, I did this and the next thing. I, I've not seen too many court cases, but I can tell you right now from uh, on the private end. I can tell you right now, I'm being uh, testifying a lot in federal court 
You get grilled pretty much about the fact that you're a liar. You lied to my client, right? You told me you had a different name. Well, yeah. So, so, Um, in, in, the federal, in the federal area, um, entrapment means that, that you're doing something, the person knows, you know, that kind of thing. There's a whole, uh, we do a lot of work with that, but. Yeah, it basically says that he would not have committed the crime had you not told him something to induce him to. The classical, yes. yeah, the classical situations, the DeLorean case with DEA where DeLorean is offered all this kind of money to sell cocaine and put it in the back of his car. And his defense was, I would have never done something like that except for the people suggested it to me, okay? So you put a bunch of cocaine in front of me, what am I supposed to do? Yeah. <laughs> so right. the idea on the so. federal level is predication. <laughs> How do we corroborate, corroborate whether or not you're actually doing those things? And if we can do that before we send an undercover agent in, because it's a technique, they're gonna do that. So in the public corruption case, we knew from uh, other salespeople that um, these public officials were taking bribes and kickbacks, because they told us. And then we went in and I talked to the person and they'd demand money from me or, you know, that kind of thing. All right, so let's, uh, let's, uh, let's move on to uh, some of the expertise that you all have, have uh, have over, over, over your work over the past 10 years and up until now. Uh, does everyone know what an active shooter is? Do we, do we have an, a, a decent understanding of, of what an active shooter is? Basically, it's your average school shootings that we have now, uh, or mass shootings. And I, and I hate to say it that way, but they happen so often. Uh, if everyone remembers uh, Columbine, the, um, uh, the images of the police officers waiting outside the, the school while the killings were going on. They could hear the shootings up above them. So what happened here over the years, and I'm just gonna just, just quickly put this down and then, and then put, in, put into context where, where these gentlemen uh, fit in on all this. 1965, we had uh, a school shooting at the University of Texas. Um, Whitman, I can't remember. I kinda wanna keep on saying Walt Whitman, but it's-, uh, it's No, Walt didn't do it. 1966. 29 dead. Um, and that 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 gave us the, that gave us the, the the police tactic of SWATs, and that was exactly how how police responded to active shooters, somebody who's picking people off. They 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 call in the team that has the special weapons. Charles Whitman. Charles Whitman, uh, 1966, University of Texas. So, so that, that remained, that's the way it remained until 1999 in Columbine. And Columbine then gave rise to a new way of responding to shooters, and that's called active shooters, um, where, where police don't wait anymore. You hear, a sh you, you hear a shooting going, you go in. But there are different, there's some tactics involved and there's some training involved, uh, which might, may kind of, and I'm, I'm gonna ask you some questions about this, but I want to, you know, first of I all, sit down on this. <laughs> but, 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 I mean, I mean, there, there's, there's a, a way to enter a building where people are shooting, and there's training, and there's protocols, and there's, there's ways that agencies work together. So I just want to ask you, Jim, uh, to kind of give us a breakdown on, on what active shooter training is when you're talking about a police officer, and what does that involve? Well, like, like you were saying, originally people were trained to stay outside and wait for the SWAT team. Because, and, and, and w when Columbine happened, they, they not only have, have, were the tactics a little different f of the shooters inside the school, we'd never had anything like that before, but it didn't really look good when you're watching on TV and all the shootings going on and all the cops are out hiding behind their cars and vans and nobody's going in and doing anything. And, <clears throat> and it did look bad, but that's exactly what they were trained to do. They were told, you never go in there, you wait for the SWAT team, and then they'll go in and get the shooter. Well, all that changed after Columbine, and it's now, it, it, whoever you are, as soon as you get there, you go in and you confront the shooter. You find him and you kill him. And that, if, and, 
one of the hard parts for people to understand, that includes walking right by a victim that's screaming for your help. If the best you can do is you tell them there's help on the way and you keep going because these things are over with in three to five minutes, sometimes sooner. You don't have time to administer to victims or you end up with more victims. So the training now is you go in, you find the shooter and you kill him, you stop him from doing what he's doing. And I know what question he's gonna ask me here pretty soon about armed teachers and things like that, but it, it takes first responders, even if they're close, probably three minutes to get there. Well, by the time they get there, a lot of damage can be done by somebody who has a, and I don't use the term assault rifle because they usually have a semi-automatic weapon like a, an AR-15 or an AK-40. An assault rifle, by definition, is full automatic. You pull the trigger and it keeps shooting until the magazine's empty. That, that is not the kind of weapons that they're using now. These, the weapons that you can buy at, in retail outlets and gun shows, you fire a shot, but you have to keep pulling the trigger, unless it's one of these bump stock operations like they used in Las Vegas, which I'm pretty up on weapons. I'd never heard of one of those before that happened. So I got on the website right away to see what, what, what it was all about, and there was a company called Slide Fire that sells them, and right away, of course, the message that we're, you know, we're not selling, we're out of these, and we'll let you know when we get more of them, things like that, be, because of the publicity they were getting. So, but so, so now Jim, the cops go in right away. All right, so the cops go in right away. That's, that's an active shooter. So that, that, that's instead. Let me, I'm just, without giving away too much on, on police tactics, um, are you trained as a police officer to go in by yourself? Absolutely. You, you, well, there's not much training. I mean, you, you, can, you can go into a school and you, you can be taught things like you don't walk by a classroom door without checking inside first. Uh, once the room's checked, you, you, you shut the door, you mark it. This is, this is more when Th there's This a, is you, this is just one cop. This is as yeah, you're well, responding, you go in and you're marking unless it. Unless somebody's still shooting and you can hear you got a good idea where it's coming from, you head for wh wherever the sound's coming from. So the standing orders for a police officer today in America is that when you show up at a school or at an active shooting situation, you do what? Your job is to stop that shooter any way you can. Uh, what, what, I mean, do you coordinate with other agencies? Like, Pardon? how do you know, do you coordinate with other agencies? How do you know you're not gonna run into a cop inside who's heading to the same spot. I mean, well, is there coordination or, or well, how well, does that there work? was a big problem with that in a lot in a lot of different type of instances back then because everybody was on different radio channels. Denver was on one and Arapahoe County was on another one and Jefferson County was on another one. And when they all converged together they couldn't talk to each other. So but in the question you ask, I'm assuming that I'm the first officer there and nobody else is there yet. But one of the things that I'm, I'm sure we're gonna to get to about arming teachers, that's one of the concerns about arming teachers is that they may be mistaken for the shooter because they're not in a uniform, et cetera, et cetera. We'll come back to arming teachers, okay. but I wanna ask you something. Go I mean, ahead. Point, point blank, it was Scott Peterson, a uh, coward in your minds. And he's a school resource uh, officer who... Uh, I've thought about that one a lot, course. and and possibly. But when you when but now there's there's information coming out that there were four or five people outside that didn't go in, that were waiting outside, not just him, but some of the other officers on the department. So it, it got me to wondering if maybe they were not trained properly in the latest and what they were supposed to do, or may have even been ordered not to go in. Because you might say, okay, that one cop must have been afraid 
or he'd have gone in and tried to do something about it. But when I see more than one officer doing that, I don't think they were all afraid. I think there was some, some possibly some order or some lack of training that might have contributed to that. Could the situation always also contributed to that? I mean, just, I guess, confusion. I'm sorry, what? Just situation, I mean, I guess sometimes it's not really clear where you're going to run or what you what you what you're going to do. I mean, I'm not. Well, I, I don't. I don't. I've never been in that situation, so I'm just. Well, one of the things to... that this one officer said was that he thought the shooter was outside, and they did have a shooter apparently on the football field. A wounded, or, a wounded or, student. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and that's possible. I mean, it's, there's a lot of excuses that you could make up afterwards. You know, if we and so. Who knows exactly what was in his mind at the time it happened, but I'm, I'm going to reserve judgment a little longer because I don't know why so many officers would have just stayed outside unless a, a higher, and, and people don't realize the control that the brass has over the people that work these kind, that are on the street, basic patrolmen or patrol women. Um, you, that's your livelihood. And if some commander tells you don't go in, you're probably not going to go in. So it's really hard to say now exactly what happened, at least in my mind. Uh, Vinny, would you like to comment on, on this? Well, I, you know, there's a lot of confusion that happens in, in these instances. And one of the things that um, uh, I did uh, starting in 2006 is really looked at school shootings and workplace violence shootings and so on and so forth. And I know that Jim also did that as part of his dissertation. Um, but in the height of uh, a situation, um, some people revert exactly to what they're told to do and some people don't. Um, I know several people who got killed because they got out of place. You know, they were told to stay in one place and they heard a gunshot and they ran around the corner and they were shot. <clears throat> and it wasn't because they weren't trying to do the right thing, it was because they thought they were doing the right thing or the adrenaline was working against them. Uh, when we look at school shootings or any workplace violence or any of these mass shootings, there's, there's two uh, points that I try to make with people. One is, you got to get out. And if you can't get out, then you have to hide out. And if you can't hide out, psychologically, you have to be prepared to fight it out. And we know that those three things will work, okay? If you can't get out, hide out, and then fight it out. And the last piece of this is that, yes, the local police, sheriffs, and everybody else are the first responders, but they are not the instant responder. They're not gonna get there for two minutes, three minutes. That's a lot of time. I mean, I'm sure that Jim, when he was a police officer and did firearms training, shot 12 shots within three seconds at a target. Um, you can get off a lot of rounds. So the idea here is to get people to think in terms of mental modeling, what they're gonna do if there's gonna be a problem. The biggest uh, force against preparedness in this area is apathy. Eh, it's not gonna happen at my school. Eh, it's not gonna happen at Regis. Oh, it's not gonna happen over here. We can do this. You get into a situation of apathy. And then I, I'm gonna let Jim talk about this, but the other, the other thing is when we think in terms of psychological preparedness as a police officer, you're trained and you think about what you're gonna do on the job. You think about what you're gonna do in any given situation. If you're a school teacher, do you remember how you got to the school that morning? Did you stop at McDonald's or was it Starbucks or was it, you got a lot of things on your mind. You're not mentally practicing, I'm gonna to have to kill somebody today. You may never have to kill anybody. So, so you're, 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 touching, you're touching on, on, a, yeah. on, a, on a topic that I, I, during, during a pre-interview that we had, I'd asked them, you know, when we're talking about this as, as police officers, whether or not, you know, what they feel, and this would be straight up opinion because it's still under debate, what they, how they feel about this idea of arming sure. teachers or allowing teachers to carry weapons, which, and through whatever legal framework you have, 
Uh, by way of background, here in Colorado, you're able to carry a concealed weapon on college campuses. Is that correct, right? Universities and co colleges, uh, but you're not allowed to carry it in uh, elementary. They specifically prohibit it because it's private property. Okay. In some cases, you can't. Well, public universities, right. I suppose. Okay. So, um, so, so the idea is. I just want to. I mean, this is this is a, it's a very timely topic, and I think I think you know both of you have, have in your positions, and you know either both in your background and in your current position, are in a good position to talk about it. So. Jim. You're talking about the arming of teachers? Is that a good idea? Personally, yes, but let me qualify that. I interviewed 10 national experts in my dissertation that I did for my doctorate, people that are in this stuff every day. And first of all, there's a big misconception. A lot of people that aren't familiar with the program think that we're just gonna go in, give every teacher a gun, and tell them if a shooter shows up, you know, do your thing. Well, that's not gonna happen. That, that, that's a big misconception. Or that we're gonna force every teacher to carry a gun, whether they want to or not. But there, there are a lot of things that come into this that that you, you don't see much in the media because it's become political now. But I had, I had a couple of the national experts that didn't like the idea. One of the problems that they felt was a really big one was a way to identify the teacher, you know, when, the, when law enforcement came in. And then I heard somebody on the other side say, well, you know, your teachers start shooting in there, they may hit a student, they may miss the suspect, they get excited, maybe this will happen or that. But if you talk about police officers, just one second, you talk about police officers, <laughs> they miss their target. They only hit their target a third of the time. Police so, officers do? Absolutely. One third of the time they hit with the person that they're shooting at. So if you follow that logic, then we shouldn't give guns to police officers either because they don't hit what they're shooting at all the time. It must so, be hard, difficult to shoot at somebody. I mean, oh, just, well, you, the adrenaline's flowing, you're getting shot at. If you've ever been in a war zone, it's a whole different thing than going to the range and practicing on a target. So, and go ahead. Yeah. I was actually gonna ask if you had read the book On Killing as part of your Absolutely. dissertation. And On Killing, the, in the beginning, he looked at people in the Civil War, and most of the people in combat in the Civil War were shooting over the heads of the right. oncoming line. And he said, why are they either taking somebody else's gun and loading it or shooting over somebody's head? And he said that there's a difference between training somebody to shoot a target and, and training somebody to kill. And to train to kill, you really need to start in teen years. So what teachers are gonna do, if you give a gun to a, to a teacher as a perceived deterrent, that's one thing. But if a teacher is gonna be out there to shoot, a teacher is most likely gonna shoot over the head, especially if they see somebody who they have seen as a student, who they've seen in a classroom. If they're not trained or if they're not predisposed to killing, they are probably gonna shoot over the head of the person anyway. This hasn't been in the discussion at all. It hasn't been brought into it. But if you've studied it, you can answer that. Well, well, well that's Colonel David Grossman, who's a good friend of mine. We, he, we've collaborated a lot on phony crime stats, which is another area of expertise. But Colonel Grossman, what he's talking about there is, is the inhibition for a man to kill another person. And you, that's why they would pick up the gun and they'd shoot over somebody's head because they didn't want to be responsible for actually shooting somebody. And if you remember in that book, he talked about what changed, what changed the kill rate from previous to the Vietnam War to the Vietnam War and afterward. You remember what he said? Well, how 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 had their training changed? Was it actually shaped? going by do, replicating a closer uh, situation of really killing and training? And how did they do that? You put somebody. You don't put up a paper target. You put something. Up yeah, they like bef prior to the Vietnam War, they didn't use silhouette targets. They used bullseye 
type target. Now, for training in the Vietnam War now, they'd have a silhouette target pop up and they'd, it became automatic. The target would pop up and they'd shoot. Whereas before it was a bullseye target, they'd take careful aim and see if they could hit the center of the target. So it became more of an autonomic response. But, and this, this is my opinion on what you said about teachers. I think that would be the case in some cases. I don't think you'll ever know no matter who you are, how you react when you're faced with that situation until you're actually in it and it happens to you. So I don't think you can say that no teacher would shoot. I don't think, I, there, I think there might be officers that might do the same thing unless they're, I mean, people's lives were in danger in the wars, you know, in the same situation, yet they had this inhibition of killing their, their and, and the only way they got rid of that was making it more of an automatic response. Which the target mean, pops Jim, up and they Jim, shoot. Jim. You're trained to be a killer. Right. And if you are a teacher and you're trained to be a killer, you're changed. Sometimes. Okay, how about so, this? So, so Jim, I'm, I'm Jim. a Vietnam vet and a police veteran and I'm a teacher. Why couldn't they use somebody like me in a school? A retired cop, retired military, that's so, a teacher. There has to be... No, no, I, I hear you, Jim. We're we're out of we're uh, oh, we're already no. out of time, believe it or not. But I just want I just want to just uh, give the last word to Vinny. Vinny, did you want to add more to what you're talking about? Are you are you good? I, I I'm not against what Jim's saying, but uh, but there's a certain mindset that you have to have. You've got to be mentally prepared that you may shoot and kill somebody, and that is a big step for some people. Now, uh, if a teacher has a gun and shoots over somebody's head and it scares them away. That works too, but there's a chance the teacher may get killed over that. There, um, there would also be the chance that the teacher would have to shoot through a child to get to the, the, the shooter. Well, I don't think anybody. I don't. I don't even think a cop is going to do that. Right. right, right. There's, I, I think that's. I, I guess where I'm going with this is is that uh, I'm not going to totally agree with Jim. I think that it could be preventative. But the other piece of this is that you've got to have special training for those teachers, not only in shooting, but you also have to have special training about safeguarding their weapon. Where do they put their weapon? Um, if I got an answer to this. Yeah, I know you do. But <laughs> if I tried to take a weapon away from him, it would be a brawl. If I tried to take a weapon away from somebody that doesn't know that, you know, how to defend their weapon, I'm going to get the weapon. All right, so, we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there. And I yep. just uh, want to thank everyone for coming to tonight's talk. Um, I, will, I will add, is next Wednesday at 6.30, we do have somebody who actually shot a guy and stopped the mass shooting, and that's Gina Sam. She was, a, she was the, um, the security guard at, um, at New Life Church uh, when she confronted a uh, shooter who was armed with an AR-15 type rifle, and she took him on with a Glock 9 millimeter, and she won. Uh, so she'll be here. So, gentlemen, if you guys would like to come, and, and uh, it's next Wednesday at 6:30, right here. Remember the young lady in the church down in Colorado Springs. That's the young lady. That the that's the young lady, sir. It's that Some very one, Assam. Yes, yeah, she's that's. Brave. That's the very lady. So, so she'll 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 uh, she'll add her, her thoughts as far as you know the difficulty and whether or not she thinks it's a good idea to arm teachers. It's a, it's a subject that I mean it's not going to go away. Um, and I'll just, I'll just say this, uh, to be fair to, uh, to those who uh, support Army teachers, is the idea is to have a mindset where you go, you go in, people are going to be firing back. Whether or not they're actually going to fire back or they're not, that's, as you can see, it's, well, it's uh, up to... Saying, the only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. Right. Well, we've been hearing that a lot <laughs> from the NRA. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you.